。哎，各位阿万的听众，大家好。那今天下午的议程呢，是由 NCC Group 的研究员 Aaron 给我们带来的呃 Linux Kernel Exploit 的东西。那 Aaron 他其实，在相关的领域已经做了二十多年的研究了，他是非常资深的研究员。那他除了 Linux kernel 之外呢，他同时也打过 Windows 的 kernel， 呃，打过 Zen， 打过 Cisco， 打过一些 embedded point to own 的东西，或者是呃，他也打过，他也打过那个印表机啊 ，Lexmark 印表机啊，然后呃，加上路由器那一些的。所以他其实是经验非常丰富。那今天 Aaron 呢，会用英文为大家带来演讲。那如果有任何的问题的话呢，请各位会众在场跟线上的会众透过 Slido 提出问题。那在场如果说需要举手发问的话呢，我们在会后会请大家举手。那问题可以使用中文或者是英文。如果用中文的话，我会负责翻译，这样子。OK， 好，那我们掌声欢迎 Aaron。呃、uh, ，Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a recent、uh, Linux kernel use after free bug that we exploited.、Um, so a little bit about me. Yeah, I work for NCC Group. I specifically work for a group called、uh, EDG Exploit Development Group, which is just three people, mo、uh, mostly focusing on、uh, end days. But recently, we started doing some phone to own competitions. So recently, we targeted like a NAS and a printer and released some blogs about that. And yeah, I've been living in Taiwan for about three years. And aside from some height issues, which you can see, I seem to be fitting in okay.、Um, so yeah, we basically originally wanted to、um, participate in Pwn to Own Desktop、uh, 2022,、uh, and it was going pretty good. We originally found one vulnerability and exploited it, and it was working fine. And then it got publicly patched、um, quite a bit before the competition, and so we had to start from scratch. And then we found a second bug, and、um, we're in the process of exploiting it. And it also got published、uh, publicly and patched, so we had to start again. And then, in the process of exploiting that, we ended up falling short by about a week.、Um, but、um, we decided to close the bug anyways, just because we didn't really want to wait a year,、um, just because there might be a collision, and it just seemed weird to sit on it for a year. So this talk is about、um, basically how we exploited that third bug. Um, and we targeted the latest version of Ubuntu, which was running five or kernel 5.15.、Um, as far as like the tooling that we used for、uh, kernel debugging and stuff, it's all pretty standard. I just wanted to mostly note that there's a kernel、um, like debugging Python script that's included in the kernel sources called vmlinuxgdb.py, which it seems like a bunch of people don't know about, and it helps with analyzing certain data structures and stuff. So it's worth checking out. And yeah, otherwise we just use like PA hole for analyzing structure sizes and code QL to do some queries, which I'll talk about in a little bit.、Um, we also ended up writing a custom tool to do the slab cache analysis for the slab allocator. We were originally using ftrace, but、um, we found it was not really suited to what we were wanting to do.、Um, we're going to release it open source eventually, but it's not、uh, out publicly yet.、Um, so you can check it out once we release it. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm going to go over、um, some background about just Netlink, Netfilter, and NF tables in the Linux kernel and how they work quickly. Just enough to understand what the bug is and then how we、uh, exploited it in a quick overview of what the patch looked like. So,、um, some people that do Linux admin or just use Linux in general might be familiar with the NFT command line、um, interface, and it's it's just like a command line tool for configuring the firewall, and so like. The example is if you want to block port 80, you just run NFT and give it a, a little rule, and it's really well documented. There's all sorts of different rules you can build with lots of complexity, and we're predominantly interested in what's going on underneath. And so basically,、uh, what's underneath is all built、uh, on something called Netlink, which is just like a socket that you can create for user land to talk with the kernel and access certain underlying network functionality. And there's pretty good libraries for using it to、um, abstract a lot of the complexity because it's kind of annoying to just do by hand.、Um, and then generally, you're talking with like this net filter layer, which is like essentially a bunch of hooks into different parts of the Linux networking subsystems、uh, that just expose some functionality that you can send packets to interact with. So examples are like network address translation and the、uh, NF tables, which is what we're interested in. And basically, NF tables is like a newer kernel, newer like maybe 10 years old,、um, for the next generation firewall, which basically replaced IP tables. 
And it's also pretty annoying to um, interact with uh, over Netlink, like if you have to craft everything yourself. So there's also a pretty nice helper library that you can use for that. And I guess most importantly, from exploitation perspective, it's um, all exposed through this net admin capability. And basically, an unprivileged user can get access to this capability by entering um, a, a namespace. And like on Ubuntu, by default, it's configured to allow unprivileged users to enter namespaces. So that's how uh, it gets exposed. And um, yeah, it turns out that like uh, NF tables has been a pretty popular target this year. Um, uh, there's been quite a few blog posts and bugs. Most notably, there's one by David Bowman, which is in April 2022, and he goes through a whole bunch of details about how it works. And um, it's if you want to follow up on any of what I'm about to talk about or read the blog that we're going to end up releasing, I definitely recommend you really, or at the very minimum, read the blog by David Bowman. Um, and another noteworthy thing this year was that someone actually succeeded at Pwn to Own in exploiting Ubuntu, and they ended up exploiting a, a different bug in NF tables. Um, so yeah, there's a few important sort of terms related to NF tables that you need to understand to under, like know, know how the bug works. But basically, um, everything's sort of um, grouped into tables. So a table is typically like a group of chains that's associated with some networking protocol, like IPv4 or whatever. And then each chain actually holds like a set of rules um, for processing packets that are coming in over that protocol. And typically there's like an accept or deny policy that's associated by default with that chain. And then a rule itself is basically a group of these things called expressions that each get sort of run uh, um, in sequence to process the actual packet data that's coming in. Um, and then, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different types of expressions. Uh, there's way too many to cover in general, but we're basically uh, interested in three for the purposes of exploitation, which I'll go over in a sec. And then there's the, concepts, uh, the concept of sets, which is effectively just like sets of data that you can provide in these sort of rules that you're creating uh, when you're using like NFT. So you can imagine if you have a list of ports that you want to block or like blacklisted IPs or whatever, whenever you have this set of like data elements that gets associated with this set structure and it all gets um, stored in like a high performance data structure and each like piece of data is just referred to as an element. Um, and so we're specifically interested in sets, that's the name of the talk. Um, and basically, yeah, it's a fairly complicated large structure just responsible for holding um, you know, the, these lists of, of data. So there's a few um, fields that we're especially interested in during exploitation. Um, the first one is the, the member list, which is effectively just a doubly linked list of other set structures associated with the same table. Um, there's also a bindings doubly linked list, and basically uh, an expression can reference some data on a set. And when it does reference that set, it's bound to the set and gets added to this doubly linked list. Um, and then there's stuff like a name uh, of the set. So when you're using an expression and you want to reference a set, uh, you need to look it up somehow. And so it typically has a name uh, associated with it. And then there's things like reference count. Um, and interestingly, there's, there's the concept of user data. So when you send like a Netlink uh, message to create a set, you can provide a certain amount of like custom data that gets stored in line inside of the structure that's allocated on the slab cache. And um, you can actually read that back after the fact from userland. And so that's pointed to by the UData member. And then there's also a UDLAN, which is just the length of whatever uh, yeah, custom data you provided. And then there's a function pointer, uh, fun yeah, function pointer table, which is kind of uh, useful. And then, um, yeah, so this structure is normally is allocated on the 512 byte slab cache, but because of the um, user data that you can add, um, you can also bump it up to 1024 bytes if you want to. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to be specifically interested in this bindings uh, member as well. So as I said, it's basically a doubly linked list. And any expression that references the set that is bound to it will have this embedded NFT set binding structure in it, which has a list member. And um, basically, that's what the doubly linked list is going to be pointing to. It doesn't point to the um, head of the expression structure itself. 
Um, and then, so that kind of leads nicely into what exactly is an expression look like. Um, basically, all expressions extend from this specific um, structure, which is just called the NFT underscore expression. And it's got one member, which is a function pointer table, and then just inline data. So basically, whenever you've got a specific expression type, you end up calling this little helper function that just returns the pointer to data, which has the actual like expression-specific stuff inside. Um, but it all will, like every expression will also contain this ops member. And it's mostly just noteworthy because if you want to figure out where an expression, like what slab cache an expression is actually allocated on, and you just look at the expression structure, it's going to be misleading. So you need to keep in mind that it um, includes this little bit. So yeah, as far as the, like the expressions we're interested in, there's one called a lookup structure, which is basically just for fetching some value from a key in the set that you specify. Um, it's allocated on the 48-byte slab cache. And we're mostly just interested in the fact that the binding member in that structure is at offset 10. It's the last member. And similarly, there's this other expression called dynamic set expression. Um, and basically, um, yeah, it's just on the 96-byte slab cache. And again, we're, we're not so interested in what the expressions do themselves. We're just interested in a bit of properties, and you'll see why later. But in this case, the, the binding list um, member is also at the end, and it's at offset hex 38. Um, so yeah, what this would normally look like is you have some set, uh, and there's multiple expressions referencing it, so they get added to the doubly linked list, so just sort of normal linked list stuff. And then again, I mentioned the table can have multiple sets associated with it on its own linked list. So this is just basically what that looks like. And each set could have a certain number of expressions associated with it. Um, and so there's another important, important point, which is that when you're creating a set, um, they, they basically let you embed expressions in the set. And it's a little bit different than what I mentioned, where expressions are run against packet data. The idea is that you can basically describe certain expressions that get part like processed when data is being added to the set or changed on the set. Um, and so, yeah, basically when you're creating this set, you can say, here's some embedded expressions. Uh, but there's a, a rule about that, which is that they have to be stateful expressions. And there's only a limited number of expressions uh, of this type stateful. So that's basically like a whirlwind tour of like the pieces that we need to know to sort of understand the bug. Um, yeah, so we released a pretty in-depth um, analysis of the bug already, but we're gonna release a blog with a lot more detail about everything later. But basically we've, um, we found the bug just using fuzzing. And interestingly in this case, it, um, syscaller couldn't automatically regenerate or generate a, a reprofile which was kind of like compelling to us because we had already had two bugs that we exploited burn during our own attempt uh, or research. And so having one that other people might think was a little bit harder to triage or exploit was nice. So we ended up just triaging it manually. And basically in the end, it's a uh, use after free um, while handling expressions on the bindings list, which may not be surprising given how much I talked about that list. Um, and basically, all it gives you is it, um, it, it lets you write one uncontrolled pointer to an uncontrolled offset, which is fairly limited. Um, and interestingly, someone else noticed that the Google fuzzing infrastructure had all, actually already found the bug and automatically closed it as invalid at some point. I don't know why. But so this is like a quick overview of what the bug sort of looks like. Basically, I mentioned you, when you were creating a set, you can embed these expressions inside. And this is the function responsible for handling um, uh, embedded expression. And so basically what it does first is it calls this NFT expression init function. Um, and, and what that does is it actually allocates and initializes the expression, or the, yeah, the expression entirely. And then only afterwards, it ends up checking the flags of that expression to see is it stateful or not. And if it's not stateful, it just immediately destroys it and frees it. And this is like weird logic because you'd think it would check the flag first um, to just know if it should use it at all. And it kind of uh, opens up this weird window of if there's sort of a desynchronization of logic between the initialization routine and how it expects to be destroyed, there could be some bugs there. Um, and yeah, so basically the, the destruction routine that gets called after it, it's uh, found not to be stateful 
Basically, it just calls um, the expression-specific destroy function pointer uh, and then frees the expression. So that, that's it. So basically, if there's going to be um, any like logic for unlinking from a list or whatever, it's going to have to be inside of this expression's um, destruction routine. So um, interestingly, the lookup and dynamic set expressions, when you initialize them, they, because they both reference a set, they're going to be bound to this bindings doubly linked list using NF tables bind set. But in, their destroy method doesn't actually remove themselves from the, the bindings list. And then they just get freed. And so they're just left dangling on this set bindings list, which is obviously a use after free. And so any like subsequent list updates of adding or removing elements on that list um, gives you a, a limited write primitive. Um, yeah, so if we look at the way like the dynamic set in, uh, is initialized, we can see the function I mentioned, bind set, which will put it onto the set bindings list. And if we take a quick look at the destruction routine, um, it basically just does some things that aren't related to unbinding itself from the set, and then it's just done. Um, in the last case, it tries to destroy the set itself, but in this case, it checks whether or not set bindings is empty or not, which it won't be because there's an expression on that list, so it doesn't destroy the set or anything. It just basically doesn't do anything, and it just leaves the what is now a free um, chunk on that list afterwards. So... Um, with, with a bug like that, like, uh, we can think as an example of how to write the address of a set into the, the chunk that will be freed. So basically what we can do is we can create some valid set um, with, that has, uh, or that just exists so that expressions can actually reference it and be bound to it. And then we can bind an existing like, or bind a new expression to it. And this expression is just valid and normal. It's just to make sure that there's an entry on the set bindings list. And then basically what we can do is we can create a new invalid set with these, one of these lookup or dynamic set expressions embedded inside of it, which is invalid. And then that exp one of the invalid uh, expression will get um, bound to binding, so placed on the list, and then immediately freed. And then if we remove the original, the first expression that we had added onto the bindings list, because it will update the previous pointer of what is now a dangling pointer, we can basically write the address of set bindings into a free chunk. And I appreciate that's probably a little bit hard to visualize in your head, so this is what it kind of looks like. On the left, we've got the set that, like, um, that's going to be referenced. We've, uh, next, we've got a legitimate expression linked in and then on the right, we've got an invalid set embedding this dynamic set that's going to be added to the bindings list. And then it immediately gets freed. So now this uh, exp uh, expression, the next pointer is effectively dangling and pointing to a free chunk. And then when we unlink that, basically we end up writing into the free chunk. So the previous pointer points back to set bindings. And that's basically it. That's all the bug really gives you, which is um, kind of interesting. Um, so how do you go about exploiting something like this? Like some ideas, um, it would be nice if you could like replace the original like use after free chunk with some other object where there's a length parameter overlapping with where you can write a pointer to because maybe then you could get like a relative um, out of bounds read and write primitive. But we didn't find something like that. So the other ideas would be something like overwrite um, some other pointer in an object with a new pointer, which would be like the pointer to the set, and then maybe build a better use after free primitive. And then another idea would be to write just the pointer into some buffer that we can then read from user line in order to get a leak primitive, uh, a minimal leak primitive. Um, but it's pretty limited. So to start, we basically decided to just leak some address to confirm our mental model. Um, and yeah, basically what the address we leak is just whatever the offset of the bindings member is in the expression or the set. And in, in order to do this, we just use the pretty popular um, structure used for exploitation called user key payload. And basically the idea is from user land, you can add keys to the kernel that, um, and you can supply some additional user data in, uh, that gets allocated in this user key payload structure. And the nice thing is because you, you control the size of how much data you provide, you can dictate which like slab cache the user key payload ends up getting allocated on. 
And you can also read that data after, uh, whenever you want after you've created the key. Um, so basically, we'll ref I'll refer to this like, uh, phase as use after free one, and the set that we're going to use for this stage is set one. So again, same as last time, we've got set one, we've got an expression on the list that references it, and then we've got this use after free dynamic set thing that we're going to free right away because it's deemed invalid, so same as before. And now, instead, we replace the free chunk with the user key payload. And then we unlink the um, expression that was already on the list, and that writes the pointer to, of set one bindings into the payload portion of user key payload structure. And then we can just read it from user land. And so that gives us the address of set one uh, on the slab cache, which is not very useful, but it's, uh, it's a start. Um, and it's nice to know that like the mental model works and stuff like that. So the next goal is to do something a little bit more powerful. And so we want to try to free some other object. Um, and so the goal here is we basically need to find some other object that we can allocate on the 48 byte or 96 byte slab caches where they can, uh, those objects contain a pointer that overlaps with where the pointer um, of like the set will be written to. Um, and the, there's one constraint, which is that this overlapping pointer must also be freeable on demand in order to give us like this more powerful free primitive. Um, and yeah, so uh, there's basically two options of what we can do depending on how we order what's on the bindings list. One is we could technically free um, an ex like expression size bytes somewhere. Um, on the slab cache, but it's a little bit quirky and I don't have time to really explain why, but we ended up just um, trying to free set itself, like free an address from set bindings downwards and it frees basically a 1024 byte or 512 byte, uh, depending on the size of the allocation um, chunk. So um, we'll explain why the other technique is quirky in the blog. But yeah, so uh, as you might be able to imagine, finding like these types of structures with the overlapping constraints and stuff is kind of annoying. So we ended up using CodeQL. So basically we just wrote a CodeQL query. Um, and basically the idea is that it just goes through different functions and it finds an allocation, like in this example on the 96 um, byte slab cache. So it knows that the allocation is coming from like kmalloc, kzalloc, anything that will use the slab cache. And then um, whatever the resulting like, uh, structure is uh, of that allocation, it checks the types of overlapping um, members of the structure at offsets we're interested in. And if it's a pointer, then we flag it. And then basically you have to go through a big list of these candidates to see, okay, is it actually something we can allocate from user land? And if so, does that pointer that overlaps actually get freed at some point? But um, believe it or not, we did find at least one good candidate for that, which is called C group FS context. And basically, when you create a new C group, uh, this structure ends up getting allocated on the 96 byte um, slab cache, which is nice. And there's a there's a member called release agent, which perfectly overlaps with the previous pointer of the bindings W link list entry that we mentioned. And basically, yeah, you can create a new C group from user land just calling FS open. And you can actually free this, the C group as well as these members on demand by just destroying the um, C group's file descriptor. So basically what this looks like uh, is the C group FS context structure looks like this. And basically the name and release agent members happen to overlap with our bindings um, link list entry. And if we look at this function uh, that gets called when you're destroying the C group, we can see that there's a call to k-free of um, the name and both the release agent. So this basically allows us to build a, a free primitive that will allow us to free um, the set. So um, in order to prepare to build this free primitive, we have to actually first write into this C group FS context structure. So the, the preparation phase, we have to trigger the, the, the original use after free bug again. So I refer to that as UAF2. And then we're gonna use a separate set for this, which is set two. So again, pretty much exactly the same before. We have some set existing expression, the use after free chunk. The, so that chunk gets freed. We now have a dangling pointer in next. This time we replace the use after free chunk with C group FS context. We unlink the expression. 
and now the release agent member is um, overwritten and pointing into set two bindings. Um, so now from there, the goal is, okay, now we can free set, like set two when we want to, and then we can replace it with some fake data. So um, this becomes like sort of a new use after free because the set still technically exists. So we refer to it as UAF3. And then we, uh, when we replace set two, uh, I would refer to it as fake set one. So basically the idea is like at some point later, we've created, like we've prepared this fake set that we're gonna put in memory. And so we um, delete, like destroy the C group, which ends up freeing um, the set two from the bindings offset downwards. And this is kind of an interesting quirk because the slab allocator uh, actually lets you free misaligned addresses, even though all of the chunks on the slab cache should be the same size. So this seems like something that can be mitigated in the future probably. But um, yeah, basically what we can do is then just replace all of the contents of the set um, with, fake, with a fake set. And basically we use a really popular technique, it's popular lately, um, using a fuse user line driver and this system call called setX adder. Um, and I don't have time to really explain how it works in too much detail, but the idea is that you can use setX adder to allocate basically fully controlled data on an arbitrary slab cache, um, and then just hold it there until you want to free it, and then you can kind of free it on demand. So basically that just means we have a fully controlled um, set. So then the idea is let's try to uh, use this fake set to do some memory revelation. So fortunately we already triggered the use after free the very first time. So we didn't know the address of set one on the slab cache somewhere um, and, and we, we can leak it. Um, and so once we replace set two with fake set, we basically just replace a few members so we can point the user data pointer to the address that we leaked of set one. We set the length to be the size of set one. And then the name also has to be valid in order for us to continue to interact with this, the APIs that reference the set. But we can just point it somewhere into set one. And when we created set one way back in the beginning, we could just pre-populate part of the user data with a known name, and that just lets it work. And this basically lets us leak the full contents of set one. And as I mentioned in the beginning, these set structures have a function table pointer. And so that at least leaks us the address of the NF tables kernel module. But actually in practice, it's not a very good kernel module for doing um, stuff in the context of this um, bug. So it was kind of too limited. But basically the way that looks is um, now we've got our fake set. With, and so the red fields just indicate the completely overwritten members of the um, the set, and yeah, so we basically just point user data to the beginning of the set, have the fake name, and then we can just read the user data from set two, which is now fake set one, back to user land, and then we leak all of those contents. But we, we want to do better because of the ROP gadget limitation. And if you remember back at the beginning, I said that the NFT sets have this list, doubly linked list, which is a list of all of the sets associated with the same table. So basically we can create set one and set two on the same table. And when we leak um, set one, we can also leak the address of set two, which is nice because uh, it's now also our fake set, which has controlled data and we can also replace it again. So we can change the data at that address. So that's fairly powerful. And also there's nothing stopping us from increasing the size of the user data length field. So we don't just need to allocate the size of set one only. We can basically alloc or leak as much um, data as we want within reason. Um, and so basically the way we can abuse this to bypass KSLR and leak a more interesting address is spray these TDY objects. Um, and basically when you open a pseudo terminal um, path, there'll be an allocation called TDY struct um, on the 1024 byte slab cache. Um, and so, yeah, basically we can just spray a whole bunch of these TDY structs and be reasonably uh, sure that after we allocate the set one structure, there'll be one of these TDY structures adjacent to it. And then that, that allows us to leak, um, yeah, the address that allows us to uh, defeat KS, KSLR by knowing where VM Linux is in memory. 
And so basically, it's fairly similar to the last diagram, but the main difference is that UDLEN is now longer. Instead of 1,024 bytes, it's 2,048 bytes. And as long as there's a TDY structure actually adjacent to the set one in memory, we can leak the dot data address um, from the ops pointer of TDY struct, and then, um, yeah, we've got a KSLR bypass. So, um, so then the next step is how do you get code execution from this? Um, we need to put the KSLR adjusted pointer somewhere in controlled memory, but um, fortunately, as I said, we just leak the address of fake set one. And we control when it's freed because of this fuse set X adder technique, which is yeah, a really powerful technique. Um, and basically, we can just free fake set one uh, on demand and then just replace it again with fake set two. And fake set two can contain just KSLR adjusted pointers. And so basically, you can, in, in fake set two, you can update the ops function pointer table to point into itself and just prepare a fake set of function pointers that are KSLR adjusted um, in the inline data, and that's enough to get um, yeah, a controlled function pointer table. So uh, yeah, in this case, like we, so we free fake set one, which just frees, again, what it, from the bindings member list down, and then we use fuse and set X adder again to replace it, and we can just put whatever contents uh, in, in fake set two that we want. Um, so then the next step is, okay, we control this function pointer table, so now we can presumably get like some amount of RIP control, so what do we do for like ROP gadgets or, or otherwise? Um, the main problem is that the, the functions that are called from this function pointer table are fairly um, constrained as far as the register control goes, so like about half of them, basically you just have RDI and R14 registers pointing into this, the fake set. And then the other ones, you have RSI and R12. So it's somewhat limited. But the advantage we have is that because fake set two is completely controlled by us, so most of the data is, we, can just be whatever we want, uh, you can still find some wiggle room to find a gadget that references certain offsets from one of these registers and maybe pulls a value out and then pulls a pointer out and writes that value to the pointer, even though it's a little bit more annoying to find. Um, and we just ended up doing this manually, actually, just um, using the, the RP tool and just grepping for stuff with the right registers to see what existed. And so we came across a pretty nice gadget, which is actually just a function. It's not really like a misaligned gadget or anything. And it's basically just a function that does a doubly linked list unlink. And so again, in this case, RDI is controlled uh, insofar as it points to our fake set. And so you can see it pulls offset 60 into the RAX register and then pulls offset 68 into RDX and then immediately writes RAX into RDX. And so this right there is like an eight byte um, write primitive, which is nice. But as I mentioned, it's an it's a unlink on a doubly linked list. So it will still do the mirror write. So as long as RAX is not um, null, which it won't be if we want to write like an arbitrary value. It ends up trying to write the RDX pointer back into where RAX points. And so technically, unless the RAX register is also a valid pointer, it will oops. And so the question is, does it matter? And actually, on Ubuntu and possibly other distros we didn't check, they use a syscuttle setting called panic on oops, and they set it to zero. And basically what it means is like if the kernel encounters an oops, should it panic or, or just try to keep going? And as long as it's a non-critical like execution path, it'll just keep going and it will just terminate that thread. And uh, you, so you just don't care that you basically oops the kernel, it just spits something on the, the syslog and that's it. Um, and actually it turns out that Star Labs also ended up using a similar trick uh, in an IOU ring exploit recently. But they actually figured out a way to make the, uh, both sides of the mirror write valid. Um, but we didn't need to uh, go to that level. But if you're interested, it's, it's, an, it's a pretty cool trick that they released too, so you should check it out. Um, yeah, and as far as invoking the gadget, there are some limitations on which functions we can call because um, it depends on which values in fake set end up getting used by the gadget, but we found this one which is called garbage collect init uh, that suits triggering the ROP gadget fine. 
basically the only constraint is that um, you have to in, like initialize some expression that has this garbage collection flag associated with it. And as far as we can tell, there's actually only one called connection limit, but it's enough to do the trick. And so when you uh, initialize a connection limit expression, it, um, yeah, it calls GC in it, and then we can trigger the, um, the ROP gadget. So, um, so then the question is, okay, if we're going to use this ROP gadget to do an eight byte write somewhere, what do we do? Just for um, a quick win, we use the trick that everybody's been using the last while, maybe a couple years or a few years, I guess. And basically the idea is that there's some string that is typically writable, depending on the kernel configuration, in the kernel. Um, and it basically just is the path of some binary that will be run when um, the system's trying to load a new kernel module. And so basically we can just build a new string out of the eight byte value that gets written to wherever we want. And so in this case, we can just use slash temp slash X. Um, and then we basically can just trigger um, a module load and it will run the path that we control. So we can just put whatever we want, uh, like a shell script or whatever in that path. Obviously, there's some limitations to that in the real world, um, like temp could be mounted non-executable. And if you're actually trying to break out of a container, the temp folder that you put your X file in is going to be different. Like It's probably going to be like an overlay mount or something. So temp X from the container context that's actually executing the module load is going to be different. So you're not actually going to control that file. So it's a little bit harder in the real world. But for something like Pwn to Own, it, it works fine. Um, yeah, so the, basically this works, uh, or this is what it looks like executing the ROP gadget. Um, basically the main point is like the value it pulls from RDI plus 60 just overlaps with, I don't know if you can read it from there, but it's uh, just members called field count and use. And then offset 68 is number of elements and another one. But fortunately on the, the invocation path of GC init, None of these fields are used, so we can just put whatever we want there. So we can just put the address of mod probe into um, RDX and then temp X string value into RAX and, and we win. So yeah, just to put it back um, from the beginning, just to remind everybody. So basically we have the first use after free that we use to replace a dynamic set. Um, and that lets us leak the address of a set, set one into user land. Um, which we can use later. And then the second use after free is that uh, we just trigger the same bug again, but we end up using a, a special C group structure, which allows us to build a, a, a more useful free primitive. So um, the third use after free is basically actually freeing set two and replacing it with the fake set. And that, um, that primitive allows us to effectively bypass KSLR um, and leak the address of set two, uh, which allows us to do more useful things like hijack the function pointer table. Um, and then use after free four is basically just, I mean, it's not really a use after free, I guess, but it's just replacing fake set one with fake set two, um, which allows us to control um, the yeah, function pointer table. And then we just trigger a GC in it to overwrite mod probe path. And then from user land, we just trigger a module load and then we run temp X as root. Um, and that's pretty much it. So, um, yeah, as far as the patch goes, the, they patched it a little bit differently than we thought, but it, like, it's actually better uh, than I expected, I guess, which is that they prevent the initialization of any non-stateful expression at all during set creation. So they check the flag first. Um, and this is good because any other like desynchronization between the init uh, initialization and destruction logic that might have existed there because you can initialize and allocate it first, well, it just gets killed at the same time. And we actually had another um, bug that we found um, that was also just, yeah, squashed by that, the way they patched it. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so if we look at the fix, Basically now, instead of doing like uh, the expression initialization, they introduce this new function called expression parse. And it basically parses the information out of the expression type, uh, just structure and says, okay, uh, just put it somewhere else that we can reference the flags value first and say, is it stateful or not? 
and only if it's stateful actually do the initialization. And so that re um, removes all of the problems uh, that it ran into. So yeah, um, in conclusion, like I guess NF tables is pretty rich attack surface. Uh, as it was shown, there's a lot of research this year already, and I suspect there'll be more. Um, and just the same old stuff with like Linux kernel exploitation lately, unprivileged namespaces expose a huge attack surface. So I guess a lot of people probably want to disable them if you don't need them. Um, panic on oops is dangerous. Userland fuse is like, uh, userland fuse driver is super popular technique these days. So it may, I don't know, people find a way to squash it or something. Um, but I guess interestingly, is what, what ways could you potentially mitigate this kind of stuff? Um, I guess one way, which I didn't list, I don't think, is um, possibly the slab cache allocator could be modified to not allow you to free a misaligned uh, slab object just because it seems weird. I don't know that that should ever happen intentionally. Um, and then there's some other interesting stuff, which I don't have too much time to explain, but GR security has this thing called auto slab and Google announced like last week or something, some new mitigations, experimental mitigations um, that do object specific slab caches. So you can't like uh, allocate and free one uh, object on a cache and then replace it with an object of a different type at all. Um, there's some other like tricks like cross cache type tricks you can use, but it seems like they're working on mitigating those as well. Something like Control flow integrity would obviously uh, make the ROP gadget execution annoying, but it seems to only be enabled on Android, and I don't know if it is available or will be available for x64 anytime soon. You could always just turn panic on oops on, um, but it might be annoying in the real world, um, just because I think the Linux kernel uh, oops is from time to time, and if that killed your box every time, you might not like it. Um, and yeah, I mentioned way back that there is a, a kernel config called static user mode helper, and that basically prevents the mod pro path from being writable at all. Um, and then of course, just no unprivileged namespaces, disable fuse server support and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. We're gonna release a blog soon uh, after this. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, you can feel free to find me after the talk uh, and talk about it. Um, and it, it wasn't just me that did this research. I worked for a team of three. Um, so Cedric and Alex both helped with lots of different parts. Uh, and we are hiring if this kind of stuff uh, is interesting and you think you might want to do this kind of stuff with us. Um, and I, I have a like a quick note um, just for the end that doesn't have anything to do with what I did really, but I have like really bad repetitive strain injury uh, for a really long time and for about the last two years. Um, all of my research is done using my voice and an eye tracking uh, thing on my monitor that basically tracks where my eyes are and so I don't have to use a mouse. And so I use this like project, which is a free project that works on Windows, Mac OS and Linux called Talon. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that project because it uh, basically keeps me being able to do my job when otherwise I probably wouldn't be able to. And it's just a reminder to everybody to you know, sit up straight and actually take breaks for your hands because if you don't, it can catch up with you after 20 years of being in the industry or whatever. Uh, yep, so that's it. Um, we have so actually, someone's asking on the internet why the mod paths are all uh, by default writable. Yeah, actually, don't know. I, 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 I've only used it for exploitation, so I actually don't know the legitimate reason that it's writable. Um, yeah, I, I'm assuming there's some reason, like that, like especially Ubuntu users or something just might run into. I don't think it's by default on all distros, but um, yeah, it, I think it is on like Debian, maybe SUS, Ubuntu. So there must be a good reason. But yeah, unfortunately, I'm I'm not sure. Okay, 那现场观众有任何问题吗？如果没有的话，就请大家再用热烈的掌声，谢谢 Aaron Adams 的演讲，谢谢。